architecture that's actually a prominent need of many of the projects that have uh, emerged. And it's also, um, it's also one that uh, uh, is uh, a very uh, practical one um, across many other areas of health science. And I won't dwell on this um, as heavily, nearly as I could, um, but it is important enough that I want everyone to be able to enjoy recourse to it. And it has to do with hemp's, ladies and gentlemen. One of the prime motivations for using agent-based modeling is not only the ability to resolve at a finer grain level um, generative pathways uh, posited to be operating, not just to be able to, to capture features that depend on individual history and heterogeneity in a more scalable way compared to what we can do with aggregate modeling. It's, it's further to capture inter-agent interactions using um, specific contexts. You know, in, in critical realism, we talk about context, mechanism, and outcome. And those are key triads in agent-based modeling as well. And if you look at context, Context includes in agent based modeling sometimes geographic context, but it also includes network context. And while I was thinking about specifically getting into geographical context today, well, was, that was my plan, I thought I'd prioritize network context here, and um, we will uh, go into to GIS possibly later this afternoon or possibly have to defer it tomorrow. So, what I'd like you to do is to go to the example models folder. And I, I need a student to do this really quickly uh, ahead of me because, uh, well, I, I can explain it more in a few minutes. But um, in the example models folder, in any logic eight examples, there's a model called Contagion version 2.2. And I would like a student to open it quickly in the particular any logic version running on these computers. Okay. Um, so uh, if one of the students is logged into these computers, please please try to open it ASAP. Um, yeah, someone already logged in. Yeah. Um, anyone logged in? Because any logic can sometimes be finicky about model versions. But it's called Contagion V22. And if you go there, um, as I will now, and you right click on it, and you do download, you can download the ALP file. You may remember that from, from earlier. And I'm going to go then load it into AnyLogic, okay? So having downloaded it, so where did I go? I went again to AnyLogic 8 example, it's called Contagion V22. I right clicked here, I did download. And having downloaded it, it's in my, um, my downloads folder. So I'll go here and I'll say downloads, okay? Um, and I will go and find it and I will open it, okay? There we go, okay. Now it opens for me in a jiffy, but I wanna see if it opens in your version of any logic because I, um, I created it with a later version of any logic, but I had to pretend I created an earlier version. <laughs> because I didn't have one uh, easily available. Okay, so, so I just want to see, can you open it? You can. Okay. Um, the US expression for it is hot diggity dog. Um, but uh, there's Canadian analogs that I won't go into. Um, okay, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, this is a model which uh, we actually built in a previous boot camp, um, one that focused on uh, building things up in any logic. Um, and this is a, a substantial model. Um, it was, it was and built with students, and you can find the videos of me teaching this model. Um, I believe it was built last year in particular. Um, but I'd like you to go double click on person, okay? And what you'll find here is a model that we um, should be broadly familiar with. Uh, it has elements we're familiar with. So we have individuals, and these individuals have a, a birth time. That, that's kind of a birth date. Uh, and in this model, 
we're going to keep track of someone's date by subtracting the current time from their birth time, much as in if we were operating with administrative data um, or data from you know patient records or what have you, we might we uh, we might see the data which someone developed uh, a condition, let's say diabetes, and we might look at their birth birth date and subtract the two to get their age when they when they develop diabetes. This birth time will let us figure out how old is someone now, because we always know the current time and we know when they were born and we can figure out how old they are now. Um, uh, we, we specify an initial infection state. That kind of tells us, do they begin infective? Do they begin susceptible, et cetera? But people are going to have two types of concerns captured by state charts. Um, they progress through successive natural history of infection, so susceptible, infective, recovered, and then they can go uh, back, so I, I apologize for the poor aesthetics of this, but they can go back to the susceptible state from the recovered state, okay? Um, uh, so they, they actually can lose immunity, okay? Um, and, uh, and then separately they can die. There's a, there's a uh, open population here, there's births that are occurring and deaths. And if anyone would like to explore that more, you're welcome to do so. I'm, uh, because of aesthetic displeasure, I'm just going to drag this over here and kind of neaten it up so it doesn't look so horrendous. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, come on, get over there. Um, there we go. Okay. These little blibbits are useful sometimes. Okay. So this is our model. We have people getting who are susceptible, infected, and recovered. Now, do you notice the little icon associated with this so-called infection arrow? What does that icon indicate? Anyone? By the way, I'm adding this, and this should say uh, waning, uh, waning of immunity. Uh, this, this reverse transition, it doesn't, I'm just trying to make it more transparent. So what does this little envelope mean? Does anyone remember? Message. This is particularly germane to this discussion, so I, I want to draw attention to it. This is a message transition. So what's going to happen here is that, and you could find dozens of videos of me teaching this sort of material, that when someone's in an infective state, periodically, that's what the self-transition is, they are going to have contacts with other people. So you notice it's labeled contact and it's occurring with a contact rate. So um, with a certain rate, um, uh, this individual's infective is gonna be contacting others, and when they contact them, they're going to let that person know there's been a potentially infecting contact by sending them a message that threatens to infect that person. And if that person who receives that message, that neighbor in a network, this is how it's gonna to link to a network, sent to random connected. Connected refers to the fact they're connected in a network. If they send it to someone who happens to be in a susceptible state, that person will then get infected and transition to an infected state, okay? So you can think of a given person here, they're in the infected state, and periodically, according to a contact rate, they're gonna be sending messages to their neighbors in the network, people around them and going to say, you know, you're exposed, you're exposed, you're exposed to this bug I'm carrying. Or maybe it's a norm, or maybe it's a rumor, or maybe it's, you know, some attitude, some meme. But I'm, I'm exposing them in this, uh, according to some contact rate, and if one of those people is susceptible, they will, by virtue of, of being exposed, that neighbor will then transition here. The index person, that, that we're thinking about is in this infective state, but their neighbors are at risk of getting infected when that index person comes into contact with them through the network. These contacts will occur through the network. That's why it says connected, okay? So that's gonna be the linkage here uh, over the network. That's how the network has, is operationally meaningful. And you'll notice above this person, it's kind of a little picture for this person, um, but above here it says connection. You see that? Connections. So these connections are this per a person's connections with their neighbors. And uh, this connections uh, 
provides a way of specifying characteristics of those connections, okay? It's characteristics here. So, for example, we say agents cor um, link up with other what? And here it says agent, and we could actually say it's, it's persons to be more specific about it. And then if messages is sent, we say, where do these messages get routed to? So if I receive a message, what state chart is notified when I received a message? Well, there's nothing in vital stats that requires it, but the infection state chart does, okay? So this may seem a bit confusing. I wanna make it more concrete by trying running this, okay? So if you go to Maine here, go up to Maine, and I say run here, um, uh, I'm going to say run, and what you'll see is a network. You'll see individuals, that's these little icons, and they are connected to one another with a network. Do you see that? This is the sort of network knitting them up. Each such person is associated with their connections, and the person they're connected with is connected with others. Um, and uh, you see this network. And, and what you're seeing in different colors here is different states of, of infection. It would have been nice if I had sort of colored these states accordingly, but it's actually using this color variable, just like we did yesterday, to have them transition. And if we go up, what we'll see actually is this little uh, set of graphs, okay? And um, most of the times that we're using any logic, I'm going to focus on dynamics, change over time, behavior, behavior over time, okay? Here, though, I want to draw the attention. If you, if you scroll up with the mouse and you move around, TAs stand ready. TAs stand ready to deploy, okay? What you see is a histogram. Do you see this? Um, there's a histogram, and this histogram indicates the count of individuals Mumble. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Jason, could you stand ready to deploy? Um, um, so this histogram, do you see a histogram? Okay. So that histogram, thank you, Jason. That's awesome. Um, that histogram characterizes the empirical distribution associated with degree centrality. So for each person in the population, we're going to ask, what's the, what's the degree of that person? Degree centrality. So they have five connections, in which case they'll be put in this bin. Or is that number of connections between five and 10 and then put in this bin, et cetera. Um, so there's some number of bins here. We can specify the number of bins. I'll show you how you can do that. We can also, as with so many any logic um, mechanisms, we can right click here. Oh, oh, sorry, it's up this, uh, this version of any logic has it up here. We can press this little button, and if you wanted to do so, you could then go and call up a spreadsheet of your choosing, and I will do Office, LibreOffice Calc, and I can paste it in, and it will tell me the bins and um, the fraction that fell in there and the cumulative fraction for these different bins, okay? Um, uh, so this is a histogram of degree centrality for this, uh, uh, for this particular network, okay? This is the fraction of people that fall within these different bins. Maybe I want to change the bin size, in which case, well, where did that live? Where was I seeing that? It was in Maine, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it was down Maine, okay? Um, so here we go. Um, so if you go up to this um, histogram, where did I go? I went to Maine, I opened up Maine, and I scrolled up. I scrolled up from this area that has various assumptions about the model. I scrolled up and I scrolled to the right. Here we go. There's degree centrality. What we really want to look at, though, is not just the graph. It's what that graph depends on. It's what's called the, the um, uh, histogram data object. So this graph depends on a data object, and, and the data object lies right beside it, as befits good organization visually of a model. Well, um, okay. Um, and 
this distribution, this uh, histogram data object specifies the number of bins, the number of so-called intervals as they are termed here. And by changing this, like if we wanted to specify 20 intervals, we could do so. And by rerunning this model, we would uh, enjoy a surfeit of, um, of different uh, bins here. Okay, there we go. There we go, take a look at this. Um, okay, so now we can go up and, and there's a more detailed uh, empirical histogram, empirical distribution, okay? Um, so these are a set of different bins um, corresponding to different uh, degree distributions. And you'll notice it actually prints the mean here, 15.99, is the mean degree for this network below, okay? So each person is on average connected to just short of 16 people. Now you may have slightly different slightly different uh, value for that, it's possible. If I run that again, depending on the vagaries of, of, of um, how people are, are arranged in space, it will connect people up, and we may get a slightly different value, 16.22. Why is that different? Well, what's going on here? Aha, well, this is shows the distribution, but this, this gets into the point I was making this morning with Susie. Okay, so there, when, we, when we think about a distribution of, of uh, connections and, and networks, there are um, certain assumptions about networks which operate off of a specified mean number of connections per person and which build the network based on that. There's other network um, contexts where a network is generated by a certain process of some sort, um, here all up front, um, in this particular case all up front, and the, the, the distribution of the number of connections a given person has emerges from that process. An example is scale-free network, where um, uh, an algorithm laid out by Baravasi and Reza early on on scale-free networks is used to uh, engage in preferential attachment and people are connected are more likely to be connected with someone who already has a lot of connections it's unfortunately the all too often form of the golden rule he who has the gold gets to set the rules um, and so the person who already has a lot of connection is further enriched um, we won't go into political uh, diatribes about how that all too often operates in our economic systems uh, as they're constructed today. But what I will say is that what's going on here is that this network um, that we're seeing here is built with an algorithm, okay? It's built according to an algorithm. We don't tell it the average degree distribution. Instead, it emerges from that algorithm much as it would also with scale-free networks. So what sort of network is it that knits these people together? What sort of network is it that connects people uh, such that uh, this degree distribution shown above is induced? Well, let's go see where any logic specifies networks. And you'll be surprised to find, and perhaps happy to find, that it's actually pretty transparent for many cases. So if you go here to main, and you go you select main, and so it's in your properties window. TA stand ready. TA scan for needs. Okay, um, so if you go to main, and you select it in the properties window are, are attributes of main. And one of the attributes is called space and network. Okay? Um, and if you go to that, you'll find that it actually specifies the network type to use. Now, someone, someone once said that teaching consists of a set of, of, of oversimplifications that are laid out for the purposes of pedagogical delivery, where then those are later refined. Um, so I say this is the network type. What I actually mean is this is the default network type. You can always wire up a network on your own if you want to connect people manually, you can do that. Also, there can be multiple networks applied. So maybe I want a distance-based network for my proximity-based connections, maybe for transfer of pathogen, 
but from my influences and my beliefs, my attitudes, my knowledge on the health sphere. Maybe I want to be connected to a network that um, can, can support connections that are broader, maybe friends and family, which might not be physically proximate, but, um, but influences me despite the distance. Or maybe a social network, right? Um, uh, through electronic media and social network. So the idea is in general, you might have more than one network type. This is kind of the default network, and then you can layer extra networks on top of that. And we'll see how to do that in just a few minutes, okay? So this is a distance-based network. And what this is saying is, if two agents, A and B, lie within a certain range, here 75 units, they will be connected. Those two will be connected. There will be a connection between the two of them. By contrast, if they lie more than 75 uh, spatial units apart, there'll be no connection between them. And if you run the model, we'll actually see that. If you look at the structure of the network, you'll actually see that writ large, okay? So here we go. And you can see people tend to be connected with people nearby them, right? This one here is connected with these folks nearby, but it's not connected with someone even over here or much less over here. So these are local connections in 2D space, not 1D. They're not just connected with someone to the left and right, but they're, they're, they're local connections in this two-dimensional space. Now, I made reference to 75 units, and Susie asked earlier, well, well, okay, what, what, is 70, what is one unit? Is it a kilometer or is it a, you know, is it a, is it a centimeter? These things sometimes matter. And to see this, I'd like you to actually go back to Maine here. And you'll notice that just above these crosshairs, um, where, where we actually have a little indication about the population we've put in, there's a little yardstick here. Do you see that? There's a little yardstick. And here it actually allows us to specify, okay, um, uh, is scale defined uh, graphically um, uh, or, or specified uh, explicitly? Um, and if it's graphically, we'll say the ruler length, this ruler length corresponds to how many meters, okay? Um, so here it's actually translating that into this, one meter is 10 pixels. So, so um, 10 pixels are kind of the length of one of these squares. I don't know that you can see the squares here, but you can see them probably on your screen. Maybe you can see them on my forehead. Um, uh, but the point is that each of these things, according to this, corresponds to, to one meter, each of those little squares. Now I could change this. I could say, make it 100 meters. And you'll notice that it now updates that and says one meter is one pixel, okay? Um, Different dialects of English call it pixel or pixel. Um, uh, and uh, I, I tend to go between them. Um, okay, um, and you can, you can choose it explicitly. Um, you can also specify explicit, like how many pixels per meter if you want to do so. So that, that gives you some point of reference and you can choose a scale that's appropriate for your context. Now, when we're using geographic models, there'll be more texture there. Um, we actually can, um, can really start to reason geographically, and we'll have geographic coordinates, latitude, longitude, for example, associated with each agent. But, um, but here, I'll, I'll just note that you can, you can be explicit about the scale that you wish to use. So, without getting distracted too much, I will just note that um, uh, that here, by virtue of what said in Maine, we connect two people together if they lie within 75 units of each other, okay? Um, and uh, that allows us to then um, sort of set up uh, a, a rule for how dense the network is. Let's go see the effect. Suppose we were to scale them. Oh, look at that. Do you see what happened? Students, do you see what happened? Do you know why that happened? Speak, students, as if all in one voice. Okay, doesn't work in my undergrad courses and it 
Not working for my TAs either. Um, change it to 100? Yeah, I changed it to 100. And what that means is the person's picture, it knows how tall a person is. It's almost like we zoomed out. And now we're saying, okay, this distance is, you know, instead of being 10 meters before, it is now, you know, that the distance of that ruler that we saw is now 100 meters. So a person's really small here. If we were to go zoom in here, um, you know, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. <laughs> there, do you, do you see him? Do you see him? He's, 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 he's there, he's at the, the center of those, uh, those linkages, but the linkages are much bigger than, than the person, right? Um, so, so by changing the scale, we actually change the visual appearance, but not, but not here, because we're not using that explicitly right yet. Um, we're not changing the logic of the model. I'll change it back to, to, um, uh, to uh, 10 meters, okay? So then we will see our people in their fulsomeness, okay? So here we go, run it again, and now we'll see, see them um, uh, boldly upon their networks, okay? Okay, now. No, please, not stupid at all. Uh, great question. I'll go show that. Okay, so um, uh, this will be part of this lecture. How how these two things. So what you see here, it's it's very important to realize. And I love Susie's question because it it points to a feature of this. What you see here is that network is secondary to, or is determined by here, where people are. Right. Whether a given pair of people, A and B, are connected, say this person and this person, depends on how close they are, right? And once we lay the people out, it's totally determined who's connected with whom, right? Um, that's a feature of this, what's called a distanced base network. And we can tweak it a little bit. So with, for example, Maine, we could change this from a connection range of 75 to a connection range of you know 300 if we wanted to do so. And we would see, what do you think will happen if we change it to 300? More um, okay, so this is actually saying now instead of being limited, someone has to be connected, A and B to be connected, they have to be within 75 units of each other. Now we're saying within a much oh, oh, more, dense. more dense. Yeah, so people are gonna be connected with further people away, and so they'll have many more connections. And if we go look at that, um, we will go see here, um, we'll do run, and you'll notice it's actually take a bit of time. Look at that, look at that. And if we go scroll up here, look at this. The degree centrality is 154 average. So each person is on average connected with 150. But some people are connected with fewer. And some people are connected with more. Who do you think might be connected with few people here? Imagine a person at different places in space. Who do you think might be connected with fewer? Students? The yeah, the periphery. Those like in the corner, right? <laughs> they only got people this way. They don't have people like that way, that way, that way, that way. And by the way, for this reason, sometimes when we build these models, we put them in what's called a toroid. Okay, it's, it's a donut. It's a, it's a donut or bagel. Yeah. Um, I prefer bagels myself. Um, but it, 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 it wraps around left to right and it wraps around top to bottom. So there's no corners. <laughs> there's no weird you know, locations. Um, and, and you can do that with a bit, of, uh, uh, a bit of work. But the point here is that there's some spread, but there's an average number of connections induced by this, okay? Um, and uh, this is the degree centrality graph, the histogram. Okay, I'm going to change that back just so we, we're, we're, we're not dealing with, you know, um, this impenetrable network at all times. Okay, so distance-based network. Next, we're going to look at a, so, so the question was asked, how are people laid out? And I'll tell you how people are laid out in this graph. Um, so if you go to population, 
We'll actually find, this is, we built this model in a boot camp last year, which was more focused on building models. And if you go to the population in Maine, remember populations live in Maine. Maine is sort of the global situation. So the population lives there. And you notice associated with the population is initial location. It says where people are located, okay? And what this is saying is X is chosen uniformly between zero and the space width. So we, we kind of pick an, uh, an, an, an any old point randomly between the left side and the right side of that space we're looking at and Y between the top and the bottom. That's what this Y is, okay? The space height is so how, 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 how big it is this way. And zero means the top. And, and for, uh, for y, and, and for x, 0 is the far left, and, and we pick a random place. So what this is saying is actually they're randomly distributed uniformly around there. We could instead, I was sorely tempted yesterday, but I decided opportunity cost is too high. I could have shown you how to lay people up by income. So their actual x position corresponds to their income, or maybe by age, right? So we can kind of see by age who's connected with whom. Um, um, or it's laid out geographically. Here, they're just laid out uh, randomly. Now, that doesn't have to be, but we'll, um, we'll return to this um, in a little bit and, and later. I Remember I told you for distance-based network, people's location, which here is set randomly, determines whether they're connected, right? It's one follows from the other. The network structure follows from the um, uh, from their uh, location. Let's go look at some other networks if we could. Is that okay? But before this, I, I, I want to pay attention to one thing. We really haven't paid attention to the dynamics. After all, we've been looking here at totally static structure, just who's connected with whom, um, which is rich. And, and indeed, social network analysis gets a lot of insight out of analysis of static graphs and, and looking at you know who's at the periphery, who's at the core, looking at betweenness, centrality, um, and, and looking at aspects of structure, connected components, um, people in particularly central position, hubs. But I, I want to note that this is a dynamic model. There's a network in there, but the network contributes to dynamics, to, 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 to change over time. And, and you may remember why that is. It's because people transmit infection to other people to their connections. This is the connected. They're sending, they're basically exposing their neighbors in this network. So if this person is connected, this red one here, they'll be exposing periodically these people around them. And in fact, look, they just got, they just infected this person. They infected that person probably. Or maybe they got infected by this one. But the point is, they can infect their neighbors. So there's some, there's some dynamics induced. And if we were to simulate this and speed this up, okay, what we would see is sort of a, 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 a okay. We would see a, um, a set of oscillations. And then it goes to, uh, students, I hope you're paying attention. I know Wade is, and I hope others, because um, students, does this remind you of something? Where have you seen behavior like this before? Not from an agent-based model. Well, it turns out system dynamics models, if you had a model of SIRS, it would oscillate and go to some equilibrium. It would approach an equilibrium. The equilibrium there would be flat. Flat as Saskatchewan. But here, it's actually stochastic. It's oscillating around. There's vagaries of who's infected who and who recovers and sort of it, it oscillates around this kind of point a little bit. But the point is um, uh, there's some pronounced dynamic associated with it. And we could run it again and again and you'll actually see the exact location of the peaks will differ. Like 600 is, is, is a good example of a peak here, right? Um, there's another peak just after 300. Um, but if we were to run this again with a different random seed, and I'll have to make sure the random seed is, is, is different here. Um, uh, so randomness, let's go see, it's with a random seed. If I were to run that again, remember those numbers, a peak at 600 and just after 300. 
Let's go see if that recurs. Here we go. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, so, so time is moving on, and I'm going to run it forward, speeding it up, but I don't want to, to miss this, okay? We're, we've gone past and paying attention to this up here. I want to go, I want to um, go to 600 and uh, at least up to 600 to see if there's a peak there. Do you think there'll be a peak? Do you think with confidence there'll be a peak? Well, take a peak. Um, you won't actually see a peak there. It's, it's different in its details. But do you notice certain regularities? Is this kind of oscillations up front where it took off and then it came down? You see that? Those are oscillations. So, so the point is, they're stochastics. These runs differ from each other with the vagaries of who happens to in fact move at what time are different. But there are certain broad regularities, and we're going to come back to this tomorrow. That often these models, they, they differ in their details, they're inessential details often but they capture certain broad regularities. They're stochastic, so it's a fool's errand to expect every time at time 300 a peak, or one at, at exactly 600. But there's gonna be some broad features that are pretty similar. The texture of this, the feel of it, when, and when you talk with physicists, they'll say the phenomenology of it is pretty similar. This is quasi-equilibrium and oscillates around, but early on you see these dynamics which are really stock and flow dynamics uh, at a high level um, associated with, at first, why do you think this peak rushes up? Anyone? Why, why at first, when you have um, uh, just uh, a very small number of people infected at first, why do you think it, a peak rushes up? Why is it suddenly tons of people get infected? Because they are susceptible. And so, different random number seed or the same one, you're going to see this, this pattern. It's kind of the logic of the underlying situation. And the exact timing and exactly when so-and-so, Joe gets infected versus Mary, um, and so on, will be different. But, but there's, a, there, there's an underlying logic that's inexorable here. There's a sort of, um, a, you know, a, a, a hideously consistent logic um, a semantics of, uh, that, that entails a, an initial outbreak. One way or the other, it's going to occur. But the details later, you know, are going to differ in their details. Um, uh, but, but you see these, these general stocks and flows. Okay, that's one thing I want to, to pay attention to, but I wanted to note something here. Take a look at this, if I may, um, ladies and gentlemen. Just take a look at what the level of this is. It's about 50 on average, I'd say. We can run it out a little bit more. Um, maybe we don't care about seeing that initial one. Here we go. Take a look at this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, younger people might say, check it out. Um, but uh, see this? It, it's kind of oscillating roughly, you know, it's kind of between 30 on the low side and between like, you know, 80, 70 to 80 on the upper side, maybe uh, that, that's more extreme values, but they tend to go up to maybe 70 to 70 to 80, yeah, something like that, and some only going up to here. Let's just go see how that changes with different network structures, can we? Okay. Can you show like how you would um, upload like a yeah. network yeah, so what I could have is a student to show you how to do that. I actually have an example model which reads at PIEC files and does that. Um, but, but also, um, some of my students, um, uh, for example, the King, um, but I think possibly also Wade at one point or another, and maybe some others too, um, have, um, have code which basically loads in populations. And um, I'm not sure if any of those include network structure, but Winchell has done a lot with it. In fact, Winchell has done a number of examples with um, dynamic networks. So we actually, we have data from smartphones, because you know, we have a very popular smartphone-based health data collection system we use with, with consenting adults, and it's used by uh, investigators worldwide called Ethica Data. 
And one of the reasons we build that is to inform models about microbehavior, patterns of microbehavior involving you know, location and mobility patterns and contact patterns. And so Windshell has taken massive amounts of data collected with tools like this and used it to parameterize the network. So agents are in this network and they connect every five minutes, they're connected with different, slightly different groups of people as you know, people stop by their cubicle and leave or whatever, they're connected and, and the network is actually dynamic. In other cases, we do it with static networks deduced from mechanisms like that, summary static networks. But the basic gist is, yeah, we have quite sophisticated mechanisms for imposing networks on here. And uh, the king could show you, but uh, I would challenge my other students to, they can show you as well, okay? And I think I provide an example model which does exactly that. Um, but um, I'll have to look and I'll ask my students, if I didn't do it, they can do it for you, okay? It's actually pretty easy to do. Um, it's, it's not a, a lot of mechanism. The hardest part is kind of parsing a file, reading it in rather than connecting. Connecting people is actually really easy. And if there were demand, I could do it in front of you. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, does that answer your question though? Yeah. Okay, okay, so we just ran this uh, with some parameters. I'd like to actually change the network type. So do you remember where the network is specified here? Does anyone remember? Main. It's specified in main, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if we go to main, um, we specified network type here. And, and that carries over to the populations in it. So I'm gonna change this from a distance-based network to a random network. This is what's called also a Bernoulli random. It's also called a, a, um, uh, an Erdos random network. It's called a Poisson random uh, network. Um, and here just random, okay? Um, here, so in the previous one, distance-based, a given pair of people, A and B, are connected if and only if they lie within 75, a distance of 75 of each other. We changed it to 300 at one point, but it's within a certain distance, right? So a given person is connected to people you know, who are, are lie within that distance, and, and everyone is, is connected up with them. Here, we actually are going to have two people connected, A and B, with a certain probability such that they have a certain number of average connections per agent. So as Susie asked, there are certain network types where you actually tell it what degree, what mean degree do you want for the population? And it will wire it up. I don't know if you remember, do you remember what the mean degree was roughly? It's about 16. It was about 16 for, for mine, it was 15.99 one of the rounds, I think 16.22, something like that. So I'm going, to, I'm going to say here, connections per agent 16, okay? It's a random network. So any two people are equally likely to be connected, but we're gonna have enough connections that on average people have 16, they're connected with 16 people, okay? Their degree centrality will be 16. So any two pair of people have an equal chance to be connected certain probability being connected such that on average people have 16 connections. So you actually specify the mean here. Now what do you think the graph's gonna look like this time? If we looked at it, how, how do you think it will differ? What was it before? Uh, oh, it was the distance. Distance based. Connections will be all over the place. It'll be all over the place. It'll be, it'll look like you spilled a set of dry spaghetti, right? It'll just be well, okay, maybe, and in, in a very, you know, your dog was jumping and it spilled a bunch of spaghetti on the floor, right? Um, a bunch of dry spaghetti. Dry because it, there's going to be straight lines. Okay, um, so, <laughs> okay, maybe you don't want to imagine that. Um, one of my students could come up with a better example. Okay, there we go. There we go. And uh, here you see like this person is connected with people all across the network, this person. Take a look at this one. They're connected. They're actually not connected with this guy, even though he's the closest, or this gal, she's pretty close. Um, they're connected with these folks way the heck over there. 
because it's random connections. Any two people, A and B, are equally likely to be connected, such that the mean is about 16. You see the mean here is about 15.9, okay? Sometimes you connect two people twice or something like that. So it's, 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 it's approximately correct. So this is the degree distribution. Is this the same as the one for distance and what it looks like? It turns out, no, I'll, I'll show you. So, so you'll notice this one looks kind of bell-shaped. It, 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 it um, has this kind of quite sharp peak, and it's kind of minimum is 5, its maximum is 30. Let's, let's just check. You don't have to do this, um, but um, you're welcome to, to do it if you'd like. I'm going to change it back to distance base just to, just to go remind us what that looked like, that degree distribution. Should have about the same mean, but um, the distribution uh, looks a little bit different. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, it's, it's pretty different. It doesn't look nearly so ordered. Here's a lot more, a lot more vagaries in it. It's because people's location. It's more, it's less concentrated in the center. You've got less centralized. You've got more dispersion going on. There's less of a, a central tendency with it. Okay, so what does that mean dynamically? What's, what's the implication of that over time now? Ah, okay, so, so we're gonna have a random. And here it's gonna influence the spread of disease. Now, when the distance is totally connected with nearby people, maybe it's my family, right? And they're only connected with nearby people and nearby neighbors. Um, a lot of their connections, there's a lot of triangles. Like, I'll be connected with person, uh, I'm A, I'll be connected with B, and, and I'll be connected with C. And B is very likely to be connected, not just with me, we already know that, but with C. Because they're probably close by. If I'm close to B, I'm A, I'm close to B, and I'm close to C, there's a pretty good chance B is close to C, too. And that those two, those will be connected. With a random network, is that, is that the case? No, you know, I may be connected with B and C over who knows where place, right? And the chance that B is also connected with C, well, it could be, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a crap shooter, you know, it's roll the dice. So they connect with that person or any old other person. So there's a lot fewer triangles in the population. We're connected a lot longer distance. What do you think that means about the spread of infection? If, if I'm only connected with nearby people. How do you think infection will spread? You know, spread to nearby. It'll be like a, like a prairie fire. It'll sort of spread out, you know, like a little wildfire in grass. It'll spread out in rings. Do you think it'll spread out in rings here? No, it'll leap across like, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, shooting sparks for, I don't know what to say. Um, help me since, um, and, and, It'll be like, you know, having bottle rockets shooting all across, you know, ejecting sparks, um, uh, you know, uh, during some misbegotten military parade in Washington, D.C. or something. Um, anyway, moving right along. Um, uh, so here we go. Let's, let's go check the dynamics out. Same basic mean, so I'm right around 16. Um, let's run. Let's run. Oh boy. Okay. Oh boy. I, I was a bit too eager there. Um, um, okay. So so now it's going between about sixty, and you get the occasional seventy. Um, um, it 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 does oscillate in this sort of way. Um, let's 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 go speed this up. Um, and you get some below thirty. You get some. You, you don't tend to get many um, up to 70 to 80. Remember before the kind of max was like 70 to 80. I don't see many up 70 to 80. Okay, there's one. It hit 80. But it's, it's actually uh, more contained. It, it turns out that the speed of its evolution is, is, is also uh, different, how it, how it spreads. Um, if we looked at that last one, Let's illustrate the point just to show this. Um, well, here, let's start with this one since we're on random. Well, no, we'll, we'll, it, it's easier to think about the, the um, distance base. Here we go, distance base 75. I'm going to run it in slow-mo, if that's okay. Um, 
Hearing no objections. Um, here we go. So I don't know if you noticed that. Let me start it again. Let me start it again. I'm gonna I'm gonna resist the impulse for speed, and I will watch it this way. So here are some people that start infected, and they are spreading it, and it kind of spreads locally from that. Let's suppose I were to start it with just one person infected, okay? Um, maybe I could have a single person infected. Ah, uh, it'll be too much work to do. But the basic deal is it spreads locally, okay? Um, it spreads from a, from a person to their neighbors and, and from those neighbors to their neighbors. And you get these kind of buildups of people nearby because of that. Meanwhile, with a random network, you get it spreading like with bottle rockets. Okay, that somehow doesn't seem like a great analogy, but it, it's okay. Um, here we go, random. Here we go. Okay, let's go see these uh, things going out. They're, they're going to shoot at long distances. Okay, so here it's kind of, you know, appearing way across the network. There's no kind of rhyme or reason of clusters of infection where A infects B and C and they infect nearby people more and, and it sort of expands out. It's kind of willy-nilly all over the, the network. Okay, um, so a little bit different. A little bit different. These kind of, you know, twinkling Christmas light sort of effects, right? Let's try. Let's try another network, if we could. Okay, here's Maine. Let's try a, um, a, a, a small world network. What's a small world now? Well, okay, maybe we'll first do a, a ring lattice. A ring lattice network, ladies and gentlemen, is one where everyone is conceptually arranged on a ring in the sense that everyone is a number along a ring. I'm number one, I'm number two, I'm number three, and I'm number four. And, and I'm connected with people to my left and right. Those say with one more and one less than me, okay? So maybe I'm number four, and I'm connected with number three and number five, okay? Um, and number three is connected with number four and number two. So we're on a ring. Now, I could show what that looks like here. I can show what that looks like if we just lay people out randomly, but it won't be very compelling, ladies and gentlemen. It won't be very compelling because it's, it's, we, there's no particular reason why one person might be um, closer to another. But the, it's still the case that you're only connected with a certain number of, of people. And we still have a degree centrality of 16. Do you notice what this, this is the, the histogram. What does that look like to you? Everyone is exactly 16. Their connect was eight on one side, eight on the other side, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the dynamics induced. Okay. Um, it's, uh, turns out it's, it's a little bit more regular than the previous dynamics. And it's actually much, it, it has some extreme values that are, that are more pronounced. Um, uh, here uh, in the extremes. But people are connected to, to further distances. You don't really see it, but believe it or not, they're connected with nearby neighbors. If you give me leave for just a second, I will show you what this looks like on a ring, okay? So what I'm going to say is here in the agent animation location, um, and I will say, will lay people out on a ring, okay? You don't have to follow what I just did, but I just went and I, I changed the layout so that people are arranged visibly in a ring here. And you'll notice sparks of infection start and they spread locally. They spread locally. You see, infection is kind of making its slow way down here. Each person's connected with eight people on each side, but it takes a while for it to get there. Do you see that? Yeah, and what this leads to is kind of slower spread from a certain place. Now, by the way, if you heard me say this is a very local network, ring lattice is very local. Where did I say that before? What else was a local network? Yeah, distance. This is local in 1D. Distance was local in two dimensions. You could sort of 
you know, north or south, east or west, so to speak. Here, you're only connected with a certain number of people uh, left and right. And it turns out that it, it matters in terms of some of the aspects of dynamics. It tends to in, induce slower spread because it needs to spread in a sort of slow way. Um, uh, alternatively, um, you know, I could go and um, I'll change this back to, to uh, use it to find. By the way, I could change it to random and, and they'll just be, that's another way to lay them out randomly. Now, this is ring lattice. I'm connected with a certain number of people to my left or right. It's purely local. I'm connected with neighbors according to something and everyone is in, in a kind of line and I'm connected. It's like I'm holding hands with eight people to my left and eight people to my right. Sounds weird. You can imagine. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there's a thing called a small world network that's a mix between those local connections on the one hand and global connections, connections um, and a long distance on the other, okay? So a small world network um, is going to have Ladies and gentlemen, here, I also specify, per Susie's question, a certain number of connections per agent, but I specify how many of them are long distance connections versus local. So here, this 95, this is like how many are just my neighbors versus 5%, one minus 0.95 is, is global, it's long distance. And if I choose that, in the extreme, if this was one, it's just like a ring lattice, I'm, I'm just, connected with people nearby. I'm going to actually display it on the ring so you can see that. If I say one, everyone is only connected with their nearest neighbors, what do you think this will look like? If I show them on a ring, what do you think it will look like? It'll look like a ring because everyone's only connected with their neighbors. Let's, let's go check it out. Okay, come on. Hey, did I press it? Maybe I didn't press it. Hey, come on. Is it running? Okay, did I? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so no difference here because I said everyone connects, ladies and gentlemen, without exception, everyone connects only to their nearest neighbors. Now let's change this to 0.05. What do you think that's gonna look like? If I lay them out in a ring, what do you think it's gonna look like? Well, yeah, it's, it's going to be like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's going to be like, yeah, a dream catcher. Yeah, yeah. So, now you may wonder what, what's going on here. Um, let's, let's lower this number because there's so many connections. They kind of fill up that space visually. I'm going to make it 1%. It's going to be like a dream catcher. Very good. Very good. I like that a lot. Um, I got to use that example. Um, oh, even one percent. Did I did I change that? I think you get sixteen links per. Sixteen links per agent. So it's so many that that okay, fine. I'll, here, let's try it even smaller. Um, uh, at some point, it's going to be indistinguishable. Um, uh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, sorry, folks. I'm I'm. I'm, I'm malfunctioning. Um, this should not be like 0.1. This is the neighbor link fraction. This is the fraction that are to nearby people. So I said it was originally 0.95. That's 95% of my connections are to nearby people. I want something like 0.99. This will be, this will be mostly local, only 1% to, to long distance. And let's, let's, let's check it out. There we go. There's the dream catcher in action. What's the effect of these long distance connections? The effect is profound. Why is it profound? If you think about how the infection spread, why is it so important that you have a long distance connection? So here we have a whole cord of this that's, um, that's not yet infected, this, this kind of, or the, that's not yet transmitting, the, these kind of green ones. Um, why do you think it's so important that there are these long distance connections? What can those connections do to alter the dynamics if it were compared to just if it were a ring? 
sparks could jump across those connections. Um, it's almost like, um, you know, you have LA, um, and maybe LA is connected to Singapore with a, with a direct flight. And what that means is, even though LA is very distant from Singapore by air, uh, or sorry, by, well, by any metric, and it's very distant from Singapore, um, the fact that there's a, an airline connection directly can allow it, make it uh, easy for someone who's sick, you know, with SARS in LA to go introduce SARS into Singapore. Uh, it can kind of jump, it can hop fairly easily. And so it is with these connections, because this one is connected with the person on the other side. If this, this person on this side of the, of the, um, the ring uh, gets sick, it can lead to the person on the other side getting sick. And so this is something that allows it to, um, to spread and allows it to spread quicker across these long distance connections, okay? Um, uh, you'll also notice that it, it somewhat changes that, um, uh, that it, the centrality graph. Um, but this induces some, um, some changes in dynamics because now no longer is the infection spreading only super slowly. Instead, it's like you have sparks that instead of just the wildfire spreading radially, these sparks can waft and can land uh, land, you know, in certain areas um, across town and ignite a new, um, a new inferno um, there. Okay, um, now I had promised, so there's some other network types. Uh, I guess I'll just mention one more feature of this for anyone who's interested. Here you can set the network type. And the very first network we used was a distance-based connection. Remember that? And I argued that with a distance-based network, people's layout in, in space totally dictated to whom they were connected. Hmm? And these other network types, it, it was convenient to view it as a ring or whatever, but it, it didn't really matter where people were. For a random network, A and B are connected with equal likelihood regardless of where they're located. Just a certain probability. Small world network, you're connected mostly with with people who are local in a ring, but it's not based on your location in space. It's based on kind of your numbering in a ring. Um, uh, same thing, actually, I, I should have mentioned the last one. Here we go, scale-free. Um, here's a scale-free network. And I'm gonna choose um, uh, an M of, let's say, five, and we'll lay them out in a ring still. Um, here, though, it doesn't care about where you are physically. It's, it's immaterial where you are, your location is. Um, rather, you're, you're going to be connected with others um, regardless of, of your particular location. So here we are going to have, and I'll, I'll lower the M a little bit. Um, you'll notice this induces an average uh, degree centrality of 9.8. Take a look at that distribution. Does that look different than before? Very different. Um, what, what's a salient feature of this? We have a few actors. Yeah. A few actors with tons of connections, but most have comparatively few. Mm -hmm. Students take note of that. This is called a power law distribution, and I showed it in my modeling class to each of you. You may remember it. Um, if you have K, if you consider the probability um, that you'll have k, um, k connections, it follows a distribution as k to the minus gamma, where, so it might be like k to the minus two. For human networks, it tends to be between two and three, I think, it's like 2.5 and three, um, for, for a lot of human networks. But the idea is most people have few, but some have a lot. And this is generated by this process of if you already have more connections, you're more likely to be connected to by, for your next connection when the network is built. So here we have um, a high, we have a, 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 a comparatively lower mean degree centrality, but we have some with large numbers of connections. And those hubs can make infection easy to spread, okay? And we can change the assumptions about this. Um, we can change these assumptions. Oh, I said it to be. Five. Let me set it to be ten here. What does M stand for? 
m is a parameter that is used in the definition of the algorithm and um, and it has to do with the number of hubs, I believe. But it turns out the mean number of connections is approximately 2m, okay? So, so we just changed, so m before was five, and we had approximately 9.8 connections per, on average. I just changed it to 10, and we have approximately a little bit short of 20. So it reflects how many hubs there are, something about that, that, that distribution. And the larger it is, the more, the more connections you will have. So if you want to tune this to have 16 connections, um, on average, you would use an M of about eight. Um, and on average, we'll have about, um, uh, about uh, uh, 16 connections on average, which is what we had started with before, 15.49 there. And, um, and it turns out that this can lead to very fast network spread because all it takes is, oh, um, all it takes is, you know, if I get infected, maybe I don't have many connections. I'm one of these people with two connections. But all it takes is a few hops and, and it'll probably get to one of these hubs with a lot of infections. And there can go to tons of people. And those hubs are simultaneously more likely to be infected because if so many people that are connected with many one of those people that are connected with are going to get infected and if they get infected they're more likely to pass it on right to a large number of people so they're kind of magnets for infection and distribution of of that infection transmission to others and so we can capture those easily in any logic um we can capture these uh, these types of, of, of networks. But one thing I haven't haven't said is I, I showed you these various types of networks and there's there's a user defined network where you wire it yourself and we'll be showing that. But I want to highlight one other thing. Yeah. So what do you use the ring network? You use it for more stylized experimentation. So if you want to understand for a given network that you're working with, um, um, how do aspects of network structure affect the dynamics you're looking at? The ring is kind of an extreme example. It's one you, at a, at a, at a realistic level, you're not going to see it in human interactions, but it's kind of like the ultimate local network. And if, if turning on the ring network makes the spread of infection extremely slow or uh, makes it die out. Um, whereas, you know, on the flip side, a scale-free network makes it explode. It gives you some sense of how is network structure factoring in. So it's kind of like, often with these models, these dynamic models, and this is a good thing. I want my students to pay attention here. Um, often with dynamic models, we go through extreme testing with them. Um, not in the sense that we you know, tie them to a bungee cord and throw them off a bridge. Instead, we, we experiment with them to expand our thinking. We sometimes try them with a really large value of a parameter and a really small one, just to see how big a difference that parameter makes and how does it affect things. You know, if we have lots of contacts for people, or very few, how does that affect the dynamics we're seeing? It develops intuitions. It helps us learn. And so it is with network types. This is kind of like the extreme low quality of, of network. We want to say, suppose everyone was connected in a very local way. Suppose everyone was connected in a, you know, in a way that was totally random. Suppose it was uh, you know, something based on, um, on a, a scale-free where we have these hubs. How might that affect things? So it's kind of thought experiments that we play out with our simulations rather than, I've never seen a ring lattice network used for a, to model an actual epidemiological circumstance, but I've seen them a fair bit used to sort of test our thinking with, with how does network structure affect things, okay? Could you, um, well, one question I have is, um, what if you want to um, model a different feature of a network besides degree? Yeah. 
that something you'd have to write in there? Like you'd have to right. So, for example, is between this, this centrality. This is just, to, is this all based on degree? But what if you were interested in another feature like clustering? Yeah. Yeah. So Wade has actually. So the short answer is any 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 logic actually has support for um, kind of a, it has support for general networks, but it doesn't build in at least to my knowledge. Maybe it's changed in the latest version or whatever, but I'm not aware of it. Um, uh, sort of some common algorithms. The good news is we've been doing that for. Gosh, I remember I remember using. Uh, what's called a library, which is kind of a, someone's implement. I mean, these algorithms have been implemented so many times, and I kind of reused someone's implementation and hitched it up to AnyLogic many years ago, and, and that was fine. Since that point, Wade, inside of AnyLogic, has implemented a number of these algorithms where he just uses that code, like, if, if, if you create a new model, you could just reuse his implementation. There's no need to, you know, reinvent the wheel. And we like to, as part of this boot camp, make sure that things coming from our group can be used. So if you have a real interest, I would talk with Wade. Um, but basically that can be plunked into a model without having to implement it from scratch. And then you could, you could sort of do those calculations well between the centrality or you know, uh, density of the network or um, you know, clustering coefficient or, or whatever. I think Wade's implemented a number of those. And really, uh, if, you can, yeah. if you can dictate the features of, yeah. your, of the network, mm -hmm. um, say you, know, you did your own study and you, you know what the features yeah. of the network are, yeah. you don't really need to upload the, the network data because you can just Correct. put in the, the features the, into that. Okay, yeah, so there's, there's two issues being discussed here, and I, I welcome it. It's great. So one feature is um, um, uh, these these metrics to summarize for a given network that, that's in there, what are its, you know, you, you could give its kind of fingerprint in terms of these different measures. We could say this has a density of this, this has a between this central, a mean between the centrality of that, or this particular node has this between the centrality, this node has this eigenvalue centrality, or what have you. Um, that's one thing that, that Wade's library makes very easy. And you can tune aspects of network structure and assumptions to try to get those closer to the values you want. But at some point, um, it may become easier to just import a network wholesale because you're, you're finding it difficult to reproduce that pattern of combination of, of attributes across those different measures and you just want to use structure just like you've derived from, um, uh, you know, from primary data. And you can do that. You can do that. It's just sometimes it can require a lot of tuning to get a network that's similar. And it may not be one of the built-in ones, right? It may be that you, you tune a scale-free network and it doesn't, it doesn't offer you the, the chance to get just that original, that, that, the statistics you want. It kind of has too big a between a centrality and too small a average degree centrality. And, and you know, neither does small world quite fit. And in which case, it, at some point, it may be easier to just say, OK, let's just use the network. And that's a very simple thing to do comparatively and something that, you know, a student could, could help with. So I hope that's useful because, um, by the way, someone who has a lot of experience with this is the king. The king has done tremendous amounts of work approximating networks from the world in any logic, as well as importing. So there's kind of just importing them wholesale in a crude way. There's also kind of approximating them, like with a scale-free network, you approximate this network you see from the world, or a combination of a scale-free and a in a small world network, you approximate this network you see in a world with this combination such that it matches certain features. And um, he is uh, admirably knowledgeable about those things. If you, if you wanted to meet the king, I could arrange an audience. Um, <laughs> I'm intimidated. Okay. But, um, <laughs> no, no, he'd be, he'd be uh, happy. He's, he's, 
Unassuming. No, 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 no. He, he, he walked these halls not several hours ago. And he will, he, um, I don't want to scare you, but he'll be back. Um, so, so um, okay. So I had promised to say something, ladies and gentlemen. I had promised to say something about multiple network types. Because all of this was tuning our assumptions. It just says network type. The truth is, this network type is actually referring to a very specific network. If you go look at person here, person have above this, it says connections. That's their default network. Don't, don't delete that. <laughs> Trust me, don't delete that. Um, uh, but this is their default network, like the network that gets configured if you say, I want a scale-free network. You can go add in through the palette here in the agent type, you can go add in a, uh, a, a, a what's called a link to agents. And I can add in additional networks. And I can use different structure for those networks. I can even say, this one is scale free, this one is small world. I can't say it by picking it from a list there, but I can actually say it pretty easily by just saying, it's kind of like assigning that variable called color to red. You could, you could do something similar where you say, make my family network, you know, um, a, a, you know a, a random network, or, well, that's not a good example. Make my, make my social, my, my online network scale free and make my, my um, uh, infectious disease transmission contact network distance based. And it will say, yes, ma'am. So all you have to do is you have to add, you have to drag in here um, this, uh, it says link to agents. And this will, this will create, you know, a, um, you know, an online network or something like that. Um, uh, online um, uh, network or Facebook network or, you know, what have you. Maybe one's my needle sharing network and another is my sexual transmission network and then I have a family uh, network and then maybe a friends network. All of these are actually pretty easy to do. What you lose with them, with these other networks, is you can't, you, you don't specify their characteristics through this nice drop down. You have to specify it in a little bit more of a, uh, programmatic way and and it's not that hard to do you can do it for quite readily and one of the students could show you I think to assign this to be a small world network um, would take a single line much as like assigning red to that color yesterday took a single line um, but basically I can choose different structures for these networks I can also make them dynamic meaning I can change to whom I'm connected over time. So maybe I, I am a, uh, an individual who is aging and I'm in my teen years and I switch from one school to another and my social network changes. So I, I add connections and I eliminate connections. Or maybe, maybe we're dealing with proximity and in the course of a day I come into contact with some people and not others and I want my network to change based on that. Or maybe people in my family die, pass away, and my network needs to change. This can be very readily accomplished through, um, through, these, uh, through network dynamics and any logic. Um, past, uh, some past boot camps, I've covered that, and you'll find many videos of me online talk about dynamic networks and any logic and how you capture them. Um, Along those lines, maybe I'll just note, um, networks are affected by birth and death. So if we were to go look at this, um, uh, I will just note this model has death in it, okay? And death in this is set by a mortality rate for age that varies by age, okay? And that's set in, in uh, Maine. So if I go to Maine here, I'll have a mortality rate specified here somewhere. So here we go. Um, do, 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 uh, it would be in uh, functions here, mortality rate for age. 
So this is what's called a table function in any logic. And this allows you to look up for a given age, what's the mortality rate? Mm. And we can specify it in a tabular way and we'll show it to us in a graphical way. So um, sometimes we load these from a database. You can paste these in from Excel or something. And, and you can use it very flexibly. Maybe, maybe this is the fraction of people you want to have to have different degrees of distribution, you know, different number of neighbors. Maybe this is um, uh, the, uh, the fertility rate for the population by age. Maybe it's mortality rate. Maybe it's um, associated with a person's hazard rate of developing diabetes. Um, these can be specified in these table functions, OK? Um, and by changing these table functions, I can, um, I can uh, change the assumptions in the model. In this case, there's an age-specific mortality rate, which we imposed. And that age-specific mortality rate is used to dictate the, the chance that somebody uh, will die. Okay? Um, and we didn't run the model long enough to see it. But uh, had we run it longer, we probably would have seen the ravages of age. Um, uh, uh, okay, let's let's lay them out randomly. Let's let's lay them out um, here with a, a random arrangement, um, an x and y. And I will say run. I could have done it the other way there, but um, I just chose random. Here, th here they go. Oh man, look at that. People are not connected with many people. Why is that? That isn't that interesting. Oh, it's a network type user defined. I'll set it to be distance based, distance of 75. Here we go. Okay, we're going to run it. There we go. And um, here we go. We're going to run. Okay, here we go. Let's, let's run this thing full tilt. Okay. Um, okay, I would expect someone. Ah, look at that. Do you see something happening? Oh, boy. Um, it's a bit of a cohort effect there, right? <laughs> people are aging. Different people, if you drill down, different people here are different ages. If you go drill down um, the population, some people are, like, th this is time 348.84 days, but this person was born um, at an earlier time, um, uh, 31 I think it's days ago, because model time unit is days. And so they were born 31 days before the start of the model. Um, another person might have been born, um, uh, you know, this is 39 days ago. You know, what, it, what it's looking, this birth time, that should, uh, I think I, when I built this model in front of people, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, take into account the, uh, the fact that I should be specifying this in days and not years. And so I specified a population that was born that was pretty much the same, same age when I specified the birth times. Where are those birth times specified? In the population. The population specifies assumptions about the people. And it's based on initial age distribution, but I actually need to multiply it by 365 um, because age is in years. So that's a model bug. People were born more or less at the exact time, so they died at more or less the exact time. Um, okay, here we go. There we go. Um, and now what you'll probably see is people dying. Some people will die sooner than others. Yeah. Um, so some people will die um, much sooner, I would think. Okay. So maybe I'm not running it fast enough. We're still in the first year, two years. Okay, here we go. I'm running at full tilt. Yeah, it's more incremental now. Okay. Um, I had turned off birth, I think. There was no birth. Anyway, um, there's other scenarios with birth. Point. So networks. It's easy to have multiple networks. Comparatively easy. You do need to write a little bit of code for the extra networks. The networks that are built in offer quite a variety of different network structures. They uh, can be parameterized. Uh, each network is parameterized by different assumptions. Um, uh, you specify different things. Distance base, you specify distance. Thresholds, random. You specify count, lattice. 
account of people you're connected with, etc. Um, uh, uh, the networks can have a significant impact on dynamics uh, within the model, um, and um, and that dynamics um, uh, can differ in a number of different ways, including infection dying out, for example, for a model like this. Um, uh, and uh, networks have structural implications and dynamic implications that are significant. Um, if I had more time, I would probably show you a little bit more clearly um, aspects of just how much network types make a difference by running this model only for a certain amount of time. I will just note here, this is important for anyone who wants to use these models in any logic. If you go to these experiments, you can set the stop time of the model. Right now, this is set to not stop. But you can always say set stop at a specified time. So for example, I could uh, set this to stop at after 100 years, 36,500. And that could be useful, because sometimes at the end, you want to do something like output the results of the model. So here, for example, I could um, uh, run this at full tilt. I'm just checking. This is a random network. I ran it at full tilt. It's finished already. And I have a cumulative infection count of, um, OK. Oh, that's, that's OK. I thought I had a, a, a cumulative count of people infected, but I didn't. I put it in there, but there's no time. Um, but you, what you would see is actually the network type makes a significant difference for the number of people cumulatively infected. Um, certain network types will lead more, more infections than others. OK, so that was a bit about networks in any logic. Any questions I can answer before we go on to a, um, to a case study here? Questions about networks in any logic? Yeah, you can, um, you can, um, you can actually, you can actually tell it at any point what the network type is, and you can say apply the network, and it will change it, okay, out from under you. So it will rewire people according to the new network type. Um, it's actually a very easy thing to do, and um, one of the students could could show it to you. Apply network, young people. Apply network. Um, uh, so you could, uh, I would say, configure Manny's model with a button. It says, like, switch network. Assign the new network type, and then say apply network. It will be done. Um, so quite, quite easy to do, yes. Um, and um, it might be instructive, because you're looking at the model running. And then you switch network types, and you see dynamically how it changes the pattern. So it can be it can be uh, helpful for learning. Yeah. Um, there are also times where we have new people coming into the population. Births occur, and there's a question: How do we, like, what do we assume about their network connections? And sometimes you apply a network, like a distance-based network, to them to get them knit into the network. It's not so much you want to impose a totally new network structure, but you want new people to be knit into it. So you might impose a distance-based network. If you do that with other networks, like random network, or some random network, or a scale-free network, they'll be aware it may change the network structure for other people as well. Okay? So there's some subtleties here. But for a distance base, it's totally deterministic. Whether or not two people are connected or not is completely determined as it is for a ring lattice network. It's completely determined by their location, either in 2D space or 1D space. So um, uh, for certain network types, it's less of a problem than others. Okay. Other questions? Networks are important. OK. Um, yeah. Yeah, true. Just not for the uh, steel frame, the M, again, and this is what is the relationship between M Good question. So I have notes about that. I wish I could tell you off the top of my head. Um, 
But there is a relationship here, and at one point I actually dug into it more, okay? And, um, and uh, I have some slides on this, um, which I could dig up and provide to you, okay? I, if you're interested, I, I'd uh, be glad to do something like that. Um, uh, The king could also, the king or I, I know that sounds like a musical, could, um, <laughs> the more exciting one, it's one set at a boot camp. Um, you know, uh, the king or I could derive it mathematically for you, what the relationship must be, because you can derive from this relation, you can derive... Like if you stuck me in a room or you stuck me in front of a committee who told me, oh, we're going to revoke your PhD unless you answer this question, I would say, okay, no problem. That's nothing to worry about. Um, so if this is the distribution, I could derive from this the mean number of people to whom a person is connected, okay? And M is two times that, okay? And th this mean number of people is going to be some function of gamma. And so it's going to be that M is some formula involving gamma in a const in constants, yeah, and vice versa. So given an M, you could derive what the gamma is. Given a gamma, you could derive what the M is. It must be so, okay? And if, if you stuck, if you fed King food um, and, and you know, kept him in an enclosed space, you could, you could derive that. Yeah, we're in the harbor retreat for welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. Um, good Sichuan food might might come from. Um, okay, uh, additional questions. Yeah. Well, not really question. I just wanted to follow up on that. If you look in the Anglogic Hill, they actually cite a paper by Barr, Abbasi, and Albert mm. uh, on the scale free network construction and which is kind of unusual, but... Uh, yes, but I will also note... So I, it, I, def, I won't pretend to be able to drive that. I, I will... I would, look at that I would yeah. further note that if, if I'm not mistaken, unless they've changed the documentation, I've checked out said paper yes. um, about 10 years ago um, and found that it did not mention M. Oh, really? Yeah, that was my recollection. I went through it. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's Barbazi and Reza, I think the um, the paper that introduced it. I couldn't find the M, but but maybe I didn't look closely enough. And I would welcome my students to to, to double check it. Um, I would I would welcome being proof on. So maybe they've updated it with a different paper. I might have complained. They listen to my videos sometimes. And sometimes they make fun of them. Um, at certain regards. Um, they said, do you know there's a video of you online where you call up a sheet of participants in your boot camps and it actually says who paid and who hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they watch my videos sometimes and um, that's fine. I, 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 I welcome all people to watch my videos. That's great. Um, uh, other questions? Questions? Comments? Okay. So um, we're going to take a bit of a break. We actually have, it was my intention to get back to the project work and then have a guest lecture. But we're very fortunate to have a guest lecture today that's um, um, a distance one. So a student of mine, Kirk Kruger, um, is going to be uh, joining us remotely to talk about um, a very interesting model that he built, uh, informed by empirical data on tobacco-related choice behavior. Um, this is a model that knits together a um, uh, uh, well-established and um, well-grounded um, model of how people make decisions in light of preferences and availability of choices with uh, an, an ideologic model in which it's embedded. And he uses this construct called random utility theory or discrete choice theory. Um, uh, to, to ground the model based on data from surveys that people filled out, these, these choice, um, based on theory from best worst scaling and, and, um, and, and choice, which 
originally came out of, I believe, uh, marketing literature. But he applies it to public health uh, concerns with decision making for tobacco. Okay? With the interest being in understanding how under counterfactual situations like a tobacco tax or a restriction on availability of tobacco to minors through convenience stores or or you know uh, restrictions on availability of packs or, or cartons, et cetera, how would that affect people's use of tobacco or maybe availability of e-cigarettes? So he's going to be talking about this, and I'm going to need to get him set up so that he can attend remotely. Um, Kurt is a remarkably capable modeler. He, um, he, he's working uh, now in the States. Um, he works, amongst other things, with UCLA colleagues and uh, colleagues uh, across the world in Australia, as well as uh, US colleagues. And uh, I want to make sure you can get the, uh, the full experience here, un unimpeded as much as possible by distance. So I'm going to work to get him set up and connected. And we'll reconvene here in about uh, 10 minutes um, to, uh, to start this uh, guest lecture. Now, that being said, if anyone feels their interests are better served by pursuing your projects now, in the morning, at any time during this boot camp, please just pair up with your TA and go off. I don't, it's not my goal to keep everyone in every session. My goal is to deliver value by trying to address your questions and needs. Some of you may learn best by pursuing your project at any given time. Some of you say, that really connects with me. I want to see that lecture, but not that one. That's part of the boot camp experience. You choose your own adventure. You choose your own preferred activity. And I would encourage you to do so, OK? Um, uh, I'm not taking attendance. And I will view it as a plus. OK, I don't want this to be taken badly. I will view it as a plus that you exercise your choice on the matter, okay? Um, so I will uh, welcome it if people want to spend the next hour or tomorrow morning or tomorrow at any point. If you feel the lecturer is, uh, you know, you, you've got extra value out of pursuing the project, go and, and be fruitful and, and uh, make progress on that, okay? Um, so we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes um, for this guest lecture for those who would like to attend. For those who wouldn't, who would like to use this time for projects, you have my encouragement and blessing to, to go do so. Um, and the rooms, uh, yonder rooms, back up. Okay? So, um, so uh, we'll see many of you in about uh, 10 minutes as your needs suggest. Thank you very much.